Good morning and welcome to Central. Today we are continuing our sermon series on the life of Joseph called Meant for Good. Our prayer is that God will use this to encourage us and motivate us to follow him with commitment and courage no matter what's going on in the world around us. We feel like that's something that we all need to hear right now. So if you can think of someone who's going through something tough, consider sharing this online service with them right now. And if there is something that you would like for us to pray about for you or for somebody else, you can let us know about it on our electronic communication card, and that can be found at our website at discovercentral.info. For the last several weeks, we've asked for donations to our efforts to love our neighbors by sending them a gift card for frozen custard. And we are pleased to report that your contributions have enabled us to send over 100 gift cards to our neighbors. Thank you so much for your investment in God's kingdom as we seek to bless both our neighbors and Rick, who owns the frozen custard stand. If you would like to give to support the ongoing work of our church, you can do so through our church app at discovercentral.org. Now, before we hear today's message from Pastor Ethan, please stand with us wherever you are as we sing together to celebrate our God. Good morning. We're so excited to lift our hearts and voices together in worship today. It's our prayer that no matter where we may be this morning or what's happening in our life, that we would find a reason to sing praises to our great God. He is our savior, our protector, our comforter. He is our counselor, our provider, our good shepherd, and our king. Let's lift our voices to him today. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, 
glorious, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. As we continue to worship today, let us be reminded that Christ is to be our all in all. Our hopes and confidence should not be in ourselves, organizations, or even other people, but in Jesus alone, because He is enough. Yeah. 
And Jesus, we thank you that you are enough for anything we face, anything we might go through. You are enough for us. We want to praise you for that this morning in your name. Amen. One hundred twenty-seven hours. You may remember that as the title of the 2010 movie that details six days in the life of Aaron Ralston, a wilderness enthusiast who got his arm caught between a boulder and canyon while on a day hike in Utah in 2003. Mere hours into his day's journey, Ralston, a competent and experienced adventurer and climber, caught a bad break when a foothold that seemed sturdy and stable wobbled underneath him. As he jumped down from the dislodged boulder and it came toward his face, it first smashed his left arm against the left wall of the narrow canyon and then settled against the right wall, pinning his right hand and wrist. There was no getting free. And in that moment, Ralston was faced with the decision to either lose a part of himself or lose all of himself. The story reveals his remarkable courage and resourcefulness as he's able to count the costs in the midst of a difficult situation where he's literally caught between a rock and a hard place. And that's not my bad pun, that's the name of his book about the ordeal. But he makes the hard decision where he takes matters into his own hands rather than relying on some miraculous intervention. And he determines to live another day, to breathe another breath, to hike another trail. But it takes him five days to come to that decision and it's an eternity of thirst, of hunger, of sleeplessness, of disorientation. And then he's finally able to pull his wits together and make the decision to sever his arm to set himself free. He's able to take measures to prevent a life-threatening loss of blood. He repels one-handed down a 60-foot sheer cliff face and then hikes several miles through the canyon to help. I understand if you need to take a moment for a deep cleansing breath and settle a queasy stomach. But 127 hours, 127 hours that was an eternity of physical and emotional agony. And we in our lives, though it's not as dramatic maybe or not as cinematic, we experience these moments of agony when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place where we have to make difficult decisions or endure difficult circumstances and there is no end in sight. There's no means of escape apparent. There's no help on the horizon. And life as we know it may end. We have these moments when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place that lead us to question why. To ask God why he has put us in the midst of such difficult circumstances. To question God's goodness and even to doubt his very existence. And these moments test and prove our faith. They help us to see what we're really made of. But there's also in the midst of hard circumstances the temptation to give up on God, for us to take the easy road that so often means turning our back on the the things that God tells us is best and doing what just feels best to us, what is most comfortable, what makes us feel safe. We have this tendency in hard times to turn away from what's good and right, but when we maintain our comfort and our security, we step onto unstable footholds that are going to wobble underneath us. No, the, these moments help us to understand that God is good and His power works for His people. These hard moments when we succeed in them by God's grace, help us to grow spiritually and they catapult us into the Christ-likeness that we're designed for, for the fruitfulness as disciple-makers that we're on mission for God's kingdom for. 
and they help us also to recognize the ends of our resources. If we are to be successful in anything in life, it's through God's power working through us. And so we realize in the hard moments that we utterly depend upon God, that we don't have the power to accomplish what he's called us to do. Hard moments help us to see our utter dependence upon God. Well, we're in the middle of a series called Meant for Good on the Life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And Joseph serves as a great model for us to resist the temptation to give up on God when things get hard. And last week in Genesis 37, we saw Joseph enduring the jealousy and bitterness of his brothers that ultimately brings him close to the end of his life, but then has him sold into slavery into Egypt. And so as we look at Genesis 39 today, that's where we pick up the story. But our big idea in this situation of resisting temptation, the temptation to give up on God, is that we are most at peace when we are closest to Jesus. We're most at peace when we're closest to Jesus. So let's take a look here at Genesis 39, beginning in verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to exceed, succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So let's take a look here at how Joseph responds to this less than ideal scenario. And as we begin in verse 1, it would be easy for any of us in Joseph's situation to see this as a pretty negative turn of events. Yes, he's already a slave. He's, he's with the Ishmaelites and then they sell him as property in this foreign land where he doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the custom. Here's Potiphar, who's this man, he's the captain of the guard, probably a severe marine type. And Joseph must be wondering, what's it going to be like in his house? His brothers are the ones who have turned on him and put him in this place. A huge cause of discouragement. And his father has no idea where he is. In fact, his father even thinks that he's dead. Things look pretty bleak for Joseph here. But from this negative start, things quickly turn around. 
Joseph is quickly elevated to a position of authority, given privileges in Potiphar's house. And so our sense of justice is a little bit fulfilled here as we see him being rewarded for what we know to be his good character. But again, the situation turns for the worse. He finds himself in an unsolvable situation. He ends up in a lose-lose situation as Potiphar's wife keeps pestering him day after day and finally forces him to a decision where he can't do what she's asking and he's penalized because he resists what she's asking him to do. It would be so easy for us to conclude here that doing the right thing, that making the decision out of character like Joseph does, is a bad thing because he gets jail time for it. Joseph, on the other hand, does not come to that conclusion. In fact, the most rattled we see him throughout all of these events is in the moment when Potiphar's wife invites him and he runs out of his shirt. Other than that, we don't see really any indication about his emotional state, his internal state. And I think it's because for the author, there's nothing to report here. That Joseph was consistent and steady throughout all of this. And the reason for that is because he had, in the good times and in the bad times, consistently cultivated a relationship with the Lord. That he had peace in the difficult moments because he had a close, consistent, regular relationship with the Lord. And that's what his source of fulfillment was. That's where his contentment lie, not in his circumstances. And we can see this idea here right in verse 2, after the bad things in verse 1. In verse 2, we see the Lord was with Joseph. He had that consistent relationship. Again, in verse 20, he's thrown into prison. The, the roller coaster goes down again. But in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. And we end up seeing that things in prison work out really as best they can, given that context. Joseph has this ability, this knack, this discipline in his relationship with God to look for God in the midst of his misfortune, to sense God's presence, to surrender whatever the circumstances are to God and his control, and to trust that good things will come even if he can't see them in the moment. And Joseph can hold with an open hand and let go things that were for his benefit without grieving over them because he trusts that God has something better for him. There's nothing that he gives away that he doesn't think God can give him something better than. And we, in a similar way, in our relationship with the Lord, have to give up things that are dear to us, that are attractive to us, in order to live out God's design for our lives. It may be a relationship, maybe a toxic relationship, or maybe a relationship with somebody who just is a bad influence on us and who would cause us to give up on some of the things that God's called us to. Or it could be a bad habit that's just not healthy for us, or maybe even that has escalated to the point of addiction and it's become a master over us and taken God's place as master in our lives. Perhaps it's entertainment and just how we let that seep into our consciousness Entertainment can be so influential for us because the emotional power that it packs and it can change our thoughts and our behaviors because of how it plucks at our heartstrings. Maybe it's just the material things that we have around us, our stuff that we either spend a lot of time maintaining and taking care of or that we are distracted using that prevent us from giving our best to God. But God's place in our lives is supposed to be supreme, that we're not to have any gods before Him, that we're to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we have to let go of some things that prevent us from doing that from time to time. And when we do so, we demonstrate our faith. We make a declaration that I'm for God and nothing else matters more to me than him and the peace that I have in relationship with him. Nothing we give up is better than what God will supply. And when Joseph has this orientation, when God's supreme in his life and he knows that nothing he gives up is better than what God will supply, well then it becomes easy for him to resist temptation. It's a simple thing for him day after day as Potiphar's wife comes to him and tempts him to give up on God for him to simply say no until 
the moment when the circumstances change a little bit, the accountability is not around him, and she becomes even more bold. The pressure gets even hotter. And then we see his true values leak out. And the answer is still no. But now we get some of the motivation that leads him to say no, and it's love. In verse 8, it's so clear to us how loyal he is, how much he respects his master, how much he has gratitude for all that his master has provided for him. That Even in the midst of this dark and discouraging situation of being a servant, when he had dreamt these great dreams of being supreme even to his own family, in the family of God, the the greatest nation on earth, Joseph has the humility in Potiphar's house to be grateful to be a servant who's treated well. And his loyalty is such that he's not going to take something, the one thing that his master has not offered him. But even greater than that, we see in verse 9 that love for God is the primary motivation for Joseph. That he says it would be wickedness. He's committed to the purity, to the holiness that God's people are to show. He's committed to not sinning against God. And he recognizes that to give in to this temptation would be abandonment of God, would be abandonment of his faith. He recognizes that it would have far-reaching consequences. It wouldn't just be some momentary indulgence, but it's going to throw off everything, those dreams, that promise that God had put on his life are all going to be jeopardized if he stumbles in this area. Love is what motivates Joseph to say no, and love for God is what motivates us to resist temptation, to be able to say no in that moment. When we have true joy in our relationship with God, when we recognize that nothing apart from Him is worthwhile, then it's easy to stay loyal to Him. It's easy to follow His commands because we know that they're for our good. And when Joseph demonstrates this kind of character, it has such a great impact on the people around him. And as we want to be people at Central Baptist Church who impact people around us, who impact the people where we live, work, study, and play, there are some great lessons for us. Did you see in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. This is a people who doesn't know Yahweh, the God of the Jewish people. And Joseph is their introduction to him. And Potiphar is able to see God clearly because of how Joseph lives, because of his character in Potiphar's house. And this is what our lives are called to be. We're to be witnesses to God's love and his truth in the way that we live, that our lives point other people to God. And Joseph's manner of living in Potiphar's life here is a positive thing. It presents God in a favorable light. Potiphar responds to the good things he sees in Joseph's life with kindness. And because of that, the blessings that go into Joseph's life because of his relationship with the Lord now overflow into Potiphar's house. And Joseph's faithfulness becomes a source of blessing to the people around him, to Potiphar's house. Our lives are to be, to be the same thing. We're called to benefit the people who are around us, that we make lives better around us as God's people, as we live in joy, as we live in faithfulness to God, as we live according to the things He says are best and that bring success in our life, as we love other people. We are to improve the lives of people around us, and we see it so clearly in Joseph here. Now think for a moment, though, if Joseph gave in to the temptation to give up on God in all of these difficult things. If when he became a servant in Potiphar's house, if he was just grudging, if he was bitter, if he didn't do what he was commanded to do, he would have lost this opportunity to reveal who God was. And think, even if he had given in to the temptation, he had accepted Potiphar's wife's invitation and was caught in the act, how hideous would that have been to Potiphar? If when he was sent to prison, he squawked about his rights, he insisted about how innocent he was and how unfairly they were treating him, he would have been a thorn in the side of everybody. If in prison, he just complained and continued to talk about how innocent he was, he would have lost all these opportunities to do good to the people around him. And similarly, in our lives, when we give in to temptation, when we turn our backs on God, 
then we lose out on the good things that God wants to do. We don't even know what God might have done because we short circuit the process by choosing that momentary pleasure, by choosing that momentary comfort. We miss out on God's best when we give in to temptation. Psalm 63, three says, the Lord's love is better than life. And there's nothing in this life, nothing that we can enjoy apart from God, that's better than the Lord's love. And when we choose those things, when we choose those lesser goods, or when we choose those evils rather than God, then it puts a barrier between us and His love. So we miss out on the good things that God has in store for us when we choose those things rather than Him. Well, as we come back to the story of Aaron Ralston, and as we think about what it means for us to choose God's best, to live the life that he's called us to, to preserve that life rather than engaging in things that would corrode it and corrupt it, what ends up being the determiner in Aaron Ralston's decision to sever his arm and gain the freedom that he had lost for those five days is when he, dis he recognizes that this hand is if he is able to escape, this hand is going to jeopardize the health of everything else that he has. See, from the moment that that boulder started to press against his hand, he lost blood flow to it. And within hours, the damage was so severe that even if he were to get away with the hand still attached, it would have to be amputated. And so that decomposition, if, if, if the blood were to take those decaying elements back into the rest of his body, then it would kill him. And so he realizes, I have to get that hand off from me. And he realizes that it, what used to be a useful and helpful and good thing, that he grieved over having to lose his hand at the beginning, it now had become a hindrance to his life. It was an obstacle to him. It was poison that jeopardized everything else that he could hope for. And when he realized this, I'll read from the book as he describes it. He says, I lash out in fury, trying to yank my forearm straight out from the sandstone handcuff, never wanting more than I do now to simply rid myself of any connection to this decomposing appendage. I don't want it. It's not a part of me. It's garbage. Throw it away, Aaron. Be rid of it. I thrash myself forward and back, side to side, up and down, down and up, I scream out in pure hate, shrieking as I batter my body to and fro against the canyon walls, losing every bit of composure that I've struggled so intensely to maintain. And so Aaron Ralston, when he recognized the threat that this poison had on his life, he fought with everything that he had in his body. And it was only in, in the midst of that fight, it was only when he recognized clearly the negative influence that that was going to have on him, that the solution to his problems came up. And this will be a little bit graphic for you, but he realized that if he could just break the bones in his arm, then the tools he had were sufficient at that point to release him from this captivity. Well, as we think about that courageous resolve in Aaron Ralston, and as we think about the biblical record of Joseph's commitment to God and to the purity that he calls us to and just Joseph's ability to see beyond the immediate circumstances and to trust in the good that God had in store. Imagine for a moment what it would look like for us to have that same kind of commitment and courage. Think about your current tough circumstances and remember for a moment how dearly loved by God you are. That you're not alone in those circumstances. Think about for a moment how Jesus in John 10 wept when his friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus, days later, would raise him from the dead. Jesus knew he had that power. Jesus knew that he was going to accomplish the redemption and purchase eternal life for all people at the end of his earthly ministry. He knew those things as he wept for Lazarus. And yet in the moment, in that intense sadness and grief of the human condition, Jesus wept. And as you struggle through the pain and the grief and the agony and the impatience and the fear of whatever difficult circumstances you're going through, as you struggle with that temptation to turn your back on God, to do the easy thing rather than the right thing, 
Remember that God is there with you and he knows what you're struggling through. He loves you and what you're going through is designed to make you stronger in your faith in him, to understand that his resources are far greater than anything you've known to that point. And so when temptation comes, when it feels like there's no way out, there's no escape, there's no end in sight, commit to doing the right thing. Commit to doing the best thing. Take courage from Aaron Ralston who thrashed his body to get rid of whatever that hindrance was, to get rid of that obstacle to his health and his life moving forward. Think of Joseph who ran out of his shirt, who did everything to get away from the temptation that was going to bring him down. And let's have the same courage, the same commitment as we stay close in relationship to our Lord. Let's enjoy the peace that he gives us regardless of the temptation and the difficult circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that lives within us, your very presence within us to lead us, to guide us, to encourage us. God, thank you that your presence is with us and gives us peace. And God, I pray that you would give us courage. I pray that you would steal us even now if things are good, if circumstances are pleasant. God, help us to press in close to you, to love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, to put you before anything else in our lives, that when the tough times come, there won't even be a ripple. We'll just continue to press into you and to trust you beyond the circumstances we see, knowing that you have better things in store for us, God. Use us for your glory as you use Joseph. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We'd love for you to share this video so that others might be encouraged. And if you haven't done so already, we'd love to hear from you through the communication card so that we can be praying for you. Lastly, thank you so much for your generous giving to the ministries here at Central. Now as we go out this week, let's impact people for Jesus where we live, work, study, and play. Victoria!